Well, good morning, everyone. Love that we are again here together on this live stream. Today is our first day of seven days of prayer and fasting, and we are going to take this whole week every single day with a very specific specific focus, and that is on the persecuted Christians, our brothers and sisters across the different nations, and praying for them. And with us today is a special guest speaker, Pastor Tim Dilmuth, who was with us last year in 2019, making us aware and also connecting us so, so wonderfully and in, in an important way to the church that is us um, worldwide going through some very specific situations that we as a church need to be praying for, and that is persecution. So he's with us today, going to be preaching and bringing God's word through this series on acts of the Holy Spirit. I can't believe, and I can't tell you how unbelievable the timing is on this of where we are in the book of Acts and where Pastor Tim has been brought in to, to share with us this morning. So this week, you're going to be able to engage with the sermon, I mean, excuse me, the prayer notes. That's going to be online, thenations.asia. And just go to the menu. You'll see the notes um, section there. Click on the notes and you'll see the different notes. And seven days of prayer and fasting will be on that section. And so you can click there and you'll be able to go into those notes. Um, kids, the shekel activity today, you're going to have to wait. It's going to be at the end of the sermon. It's going to be at the end of the message. And it's not going to necessarily have to do with just today. It's going to actually have to do with through through the week. So I'm going to save it for last. So if you can sit tight, listen and to God's word today, I'll share that after the message this morning. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Pastor Tim Dilmuth, uh, Voice of the Martyrs Korea. Uh, it's an organization that really joins together in the telling and the living out of the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ uh, in a really powerful way. And I'll let him share a little bit more about that. And so if you can join with me in welcoming Pastor Tim Dilmuth, I'll turn it over to him. Hello, everyone. It's really good to be with you today. My wife is also with us, although obviously you can't see her. I have to be honest, though, I think I'm a bit more nervous uh, preaching this way than I would be if I was with you in person. It reminds me a little bit of when we started with Voice of the Martyrs Korea. We originally were based in the U.S., and so every Saturday, all day, we do a North Korean, Korean training school. We have two training schools, one for brand new North Korean Christians and the other for Christians uh, who are training to be missionaries to their own people. But since we were in the U.S., I used to uh, do it online, except I was in the basement of our home in a dimly lit basement late at night on Friday night teaching North Koreans. So this is a much more beautiful setup. Uh, God has really blessed the nation's church, and I'm so happy to be here with you. Today, we're going to be sharing a little bit about Acts chapter 7 and the martyrdom of Stephen. And often when we talk about martyrdom, it, it really seems like ancient history. Of course, we know that it's in the Bible, uh, but often we think of the early Christian martyrs like Polycarp or Ignatius or Perpetua, and we, we just have this image that it's, it happened so long ago, it's hardly relevant to us today. And what helps to perpetuate, perpetuate that myth, I think, a lot of times is the fact of how the stories are written. So I've I've uh, written down just a little bit about the martyrdom of Polycarp I want to share with you. And it says, When he was tied to the stake and the fire was lit, the flames allegedly formed an arc around him and didn't burn him. The frustrated officials then ordered him to be stabbed to death, whereupon a dove was seen to fly from his body. Now we know that miracles happen, right? But we know that this is not the scriptures. This is not canon. So when we read this story, we say, well, what really happened? So we tend to stay away from stories like this because we don't quite know what is true and what is not true. But for us at Voice of the Martyrs Korea, martyrdom isn't something that happened 2,000 years ago. 
It's something that we live and breathe on a daily basis. Since Voice of the Martyrs Korea started 20 years ago, there have been 36 martyrs directly associated with our ministry. There have been men and women that we knew personally. In fact, four years ago, almost to this very day, but April 30th, 2016, one of our closest ministry partners, Pastor Han, was martyred in northeast China. North Korean state security agents came across the border and they kidnapped him and violently stabbed him to death. But just a few months prior to that, he was with us in our offices in Seoul. So I want to share with you Pastor Han's story this morning through video. Last year, Voice of the Martyrs U.S. came to Korea, and we worked together to produce this six-minute video on the life of Pastor Han that was told through one of his disciples, Sang Chol. Now, for those of you who are Korean-speaking, I would encourage you later this week to view the Korean link. Um, the nations will post this link. But the Korean video is about double the length and gives a lot of details on the story that the English version doesn't. But this morning, I wanted to watch together the story of Pastor Han with you. So let's watch the video together. In the primary school, we were taught that all missionaries were terrorists. They told us that a missionary will be nice to you at first, but when they get you into their homes, then they will kill you and eat your liver. There was no food and no work in my village. Like some others, I snuck across the mountain border into China. I picked mushrooms in the hopes of selling them in Chiang Mai. I don't speak Chinese at all. But in the mountains, I met a man. He said, I can sell those for you. And he didn't cheat me. He gave me all the money from the sale. At that time, I didn't know he was Pastor Han. Over the next two years, I went back several times. Each time, Pastor Han helped me. One day, I asked why he would do this, for he himself was in great danger for assisting a North Korea. It is because I am a Christian, he said. That made me afraid. Was he going to eat my liver? One day, Pastor Han said to me, God is real. There is hope for every person. I could not believe he would say that word, God. Nobody says that word. We know it is an act of treason. To speak the name of God can lead to soldiers coming in the night. will write about you, and no one will ever dare ask where you have gone. One day I asked Pastor Han for a Bible. He knew that if I was caught with a Bible, my life would be in danger. But over time, I persuaded him. 
I showed the Bible to my wife. At first, she refused to even look at it. Why would you bring that here? She cried. She knew that if anyone reported that you had even glanced at a Bible, you would be arrested, and not just you. You and all your relatives sent to the concentration camps for years and years and years. Over time, my wife too learned that God is real. She found hope. And then I shared the word of God with my best friend. It was very dangerous for me to share. It was very dangerous for him to listen. One day in the summer of 2016, we heard that some North Korean assassins were being honored by the government, rewarded for their good work for killing a terrorist missionary in Chiang Mai. We knew it was Pastor Han. Who else could it be? We, we were frightened. Did they know he was my friend? Did they know I had met with him many times? <laughs> Pastor Han gave his life, but he gave hope to me and to many other North Koreans. And despite the ever-present danger, Many of us will continue to share the message that God is real. We hope that our sacrifice, when the day comes, will be worthwhile, just like it was for Pastor Han. In more than 70 nations around the world today, Christians are persecuted for their faith. And of course, in South Korea, we're surrounded by many nations that do just that, North Korea and China in particular. In fact, over the last few years in China, things have been steadily getting worse. Even during this time of the coronavirus, while many churches, including yours, are moving online in China, they officially banned online church services and churches and pastors have been arrested. And, and so today, as we're worshiping together online, we're doing something that would be expressly illegal in the country of China. As I mentioned before, for us at Voice of the Martyrs Korea, martyrdom is something that's an everyday part of our lives. It's something that is not ancient history. And in fact, the numbers are shocking. Uh, on our wall in Voice of the Martyrs, we have a graphic, and it shows just how many martyrs, uh, how many uh, people have been martyred over the last 100 years compared to all the years previously to the time of Christ. Over the last 120 years, there have been 455,000 people that have given their lives for the Lord. This morning, I want to talk about this through Acts chapter 7 and the martyrdom of Stephen. But before we look at Acts chapter 7 too closely, I want to go all the way back 
to Acts chapter 1. I know this is a review for all of you because you've been studying over the last few weeks. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, I want to read this to you. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. I want to ask you, what do you think the primary role of a Christian is? Now, uh, you can already see the answer there this morning, but the primary role of a, of a Christian is that of a witness. Now, I wouldn't have known this otherwise, and in fact, I wanted to see what other people had to say about this very question, so I googled it, and I said, you know, what, what is the primary role of a Christian? What is the job of a Christian? And I found a lot of different answers, but I never found this answer. I found people said the primary role of a Christian is to attend church regularly, to share the gospel, to evangelize the lost, to glorify God. These are all really good answers, aren't they? But it's interesting that Jesus in Acts 1.8 says, you will be my witnesses. Now, the Greek word for witnesses is where we get the word martyr from. And this occurs 39 times in the book of Acts. The, the Greek word for witnesses, martus, and its other forms occurs 39 times. But in all of the New Testament, this occurs about 200 times. And if we widen the scope a little bit and look at the Old Testament, we see that this word, um, in the Hebrew form, of course, occurs about 200 times in the Old Testament. So over 400 times in the Bible, we see this word and this theme expressed. Now, we know if the Bible tells us something that it's really important. The Bible is God's word. But I tell my kids, often jokingly, that if the Bible repeats itself two times, three times, four times, we better really take notice. That's kind of funny, right? Because if the Bible says something one, one time, we have to take notice. But if the Bible repeats itself over and over and over again, then we really have to take stock and take time and try to understand what God is saying. This word, many scholars have said, can help us even understand the, the whole scope of the Bible because really, from the beginning in Genesis, when it says that we are made in God's image, we have that idea of us being a witness to God because we are made in his image. All the way through the Bible to Revelation, where we see Jesus described as the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. So this theme of witness is throughout the scriptures. Now, one interesting thing that I found as I researched, is that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Jesus is not saying, well, you, you can be my witnesses if you try really hard, or maybe, you know, someday you could be, or even that you should be. Jesus is stating it as a future fact. You will be my witnesses. And this reminded me of a passage in Isaiah 43, where God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells the people of Israel, you are my witnesses. Now, we know at different points in time, the Israelites were not very good witnesses, but, but Isaiah simply says, you are my witnesses. The Bible has a concept that we are the witnesses of God, whether we want to be or not. Uh, another good example of this is when the Lord says about Nebuchadnezzar, and about Cyrus, that they are my servants. Certainly not the kind of servants that we think of, right? We think of Paul and Peter as being really good servants of God, but not necessarily Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. But we have this idea in Scripture that everything created by the Lord, especially human beings, because we are made in the image of God. But the book of Joshua even points to the rocks as being witnesses unto God. So everything created by God, is a witness to the Lord. Some are willing witnesses, and some are unwilling witnesses, but the fact is, everyone will be a witness. Now, we're studying the book of Acts, and Acts chapter 7, the martyrdom of Stephen, so of course, we're talking about being a willing witness. We're talking about following in the footsteps of the faithful witness, Jesus Christ, so I want to talk about this morning, what does it mean to be a, a faithful, a living witness? Or can I say, what does it mean to be a martyr? When we talk about martyrs, we often think of people who have died like Pastor Han 
in the video that we just watched. But the fact is, Pastor Han was a martyr long before he died because he was a living witness, a living martyr. And when we think of it that way, martyrdom doesn't have to be so scary at all because we're talking about our testimony on a day-to-day -day basis before the Lord and before the world. Now, I want to talk about what that witness is. The Bible says that the martyr's witness is that God is in complete control. And I want to take a look at Acts chapter 4, verse 24 with you. Now, this, is, this happens right after Peter and John have been released from prison. And they pray this prayer together. They say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now, you'll remember that they made a witness to the rulers and the elders and uh, after that, they were charged not to preach again. And I love what they said here. They said, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Here's that idea of a witness once again. For we cannot but speak of this. And immediately after they said that, they prayed this prayer. But what I love about that is that they start the prayer not just with saying God, but they say, Sovereign Lord. Now, at the end of the book of Matthew, the Great Commission the Great Commission actually starts off with Christ saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We get the picture here in the book of Acts that no matter how bad the situation is, right? Peter and John were just in prison. No matter how bad the situation is, God is still in control. Matthew chapter 28 says Jesus has all authority. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what we can see with our eyes or what we can hear with our ears or what we can feel with our hands or even what we can know because the Bible tells us, the Bible gives us the promise that all authority and power has been given to Jesus. And this is what the disciples are saying. They're saying, Sovereign Lord. We know that we've just been in jail. We know that the situation looks bad. But Lord, we know you are in control. And this is really the witness, right, that we're talking about because what we're saying is that no matter what happens to us in our day-to-day -day lives, we know that God is in control. So I'm going to live like God is in control. I'm going to act like God is in control. I'm going to speak like God is in control. I'm going to think like God is in control. That is the witness. That is the faithful living witness. That is the martyr's witness that the the disciples in the book of Acts made every single chapter. I, I can even say, I think that this is kind of a theme in the book of Acts, right? Throughout all the chapters, we see the disciples, the apostles, making a living witness. And now we get to Acts chapter 7. And in some ways, this is a really bad chapter, right? We have this young guy, Stephen, who's full of promise and potential. The Bible says that he was full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord was doing miracles for him. He had a, a really bright future. And yet we see that that future, at least the way that we think of it, uh, was ending. And it was ending at the end of chapter 7 with Stephen being stoned violently. Um, But yet we know that the Lord is in control. Because at the end of Acts chapter 7 and verse 58, we see uh, the people that were stoning Stephen laying their cloaks at the feet of a man named Saul. And of course, we know the rest of the story, don't we? With Pastor Han in the video that I just showed you, I mentioned that just a few months before he was killed, uh, he was in our offices in Seoul, and at that time we were located in Mapo. And he shared with us at that time that there was an order from North Korea that he was to be uh, kidnapped and interrogated. And so he knew that if he went back to Northeast China, that there was a good chance that that could happen to him. You see, in that Northeast China region, uh, China allows North Korea state security agents to go across the border most of the time to kidnap North Koreans and take them back to North Korea. But he knew it was wholly possible that North Korean state security agents would come across the border and capture him. And yet as he stood in our offices that day, he recounted these things to us without any fear. Now he was, he was very soberly assessing the situation 
Uh, but he knew that he had to do what God called him to do. He wasn't going to run away with fear. He wasn't going to change what God had called him to do. He was going to act with all wisdom. But he knew that he had to carry out the, the witness that God had given him to make. And this is truly the way that we uh, approach all things at Voice of the Martyrs Korea. We never want to be crazy with what we're doing. We always want to act with wisdom. Security is at the top of our priority list, security of information and the security of our people. But ultimately, our lives are in God's hands, right? God controls whether we live or die, and we can't just stop testifying about the Lord because the situation is dangerous. Uh, during the time of the coronavirus, we had a neat opportunity to provide masks and living necessities for North Koreans, uh, both inside of North Korea and in Northeast China. But to me, this was just another example of the Lord at work in a difficult situation. North Koreans in Northeast China um, have a really difficult situation because they have no ID card, no way to get medical treatment. They can't even see a doctor. So especially during the time of the coronavirus, they're at a lot of risk. So the Lord allowed us to raise money and gather supplies and distribute to our North Korean brothers and sisters in Northeast China. But one of the things that we were able to do is as we delivered these masks, we were also able to deliver the Word of God through MP3 players. And um, I want to read you a short testimony from one North Korean. Actually, this man was living inside of North Korea. And um, when he received the MP3 player, he said, I receive hope of living as I am praying. He said, the situation in Pyongyang and Shiniju is more serious than other border areas. I think we will all die from starvation or being infected. Both are deadly and cause despair. But listen to this. He says, after knowing him, my fear has vanished. We know that being a Christian, even if we don't live in places like China and North Korea, is dangerous. But we know the Lord is in control. And Romans 8.28 tells us that God is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke that to be a Christian means danger. He said, to be a Christian means you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And this is not a safe proposition for anyone. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, if you want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. But remember, God is still in control. Jesus has all authority, despite what it looks like, despite what it feels like. God is in control. And that's what the apostles prayed in Acts 4.24, Sovereign Lord. Now, as I mentioned before, the Bible says at the end of chapter 7, in verse 58, um, the people who were stoning Stephen laid their garments at the foot of a young man named Saul. In the beginning of the next chapter, chapter 8, we read that Saul approved of what happened to Stephen and that he was ravaging the church. Now, we know the rest of the story, don't we? One chapter later, in chapter 9, we see the Lord arresting Saul on the Damascus road and we could say that Saul went to Paul, from Saul to Paul. God is still working in many of the same ways today. Even 2,000 years later, we meet men and women all over the world who are now being persecuted for their faith, who are in fact former persecutors. In fact, we just produced a newsletter at VOM Korea, and we do this every month both in Korean and English. And this past month, the theme of our whole newsletter is going from Saul to Paul. And on the front cover, we have a picture of a man named Kin. And Kin is from Myanmar, and he grew up uh, his whole life very much against Christianity. Uh, but in his 20s, he became an officer in the Myanmar army. And so he used his position to persecute Christians that were under his care. For example, if he saw someone praying in the barracks, he would often go up and purposely interrupt them. Now, that might not sound so bad, but he did more. Uh, if he saw someone reading the Bible, he would hit the Bible harshly and make it smack on the ground. And then when he would see these same Christians eating in the dining hall, he would swipe 
their food off the table and, and make them pick it up. Now, if he knew that anyone was a Buddhist and converted to Christianity, then he would violently beat them. And so this was, this was Kin's life, until which point that he was arrested and put in prison for a totally different matter. But Kin had lost his weapon. And when you lose your weapon in the Myanmar army, that's serious business. It wasn't his fault, but he was still charged and sent to prison. But remember how we keep talking about God is in control? Uh, two of his prison mates were Christians. And over the days and over the weeks and over the months, they were witnessing to Kin. And Kin eventually gave his life to the Lord. And about that same time, Kin was released from prison because um, the truth was found out that someone had stolen his gun and they confessed and Kin was released. He was given the opportunity to go back into the army, but he said, I want to dedicate my life to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now Kin travels all around Myanmar sharing the gospel to different villages. And as you might have suspected, now Kin is persecuted for that same faith that he used to persecute others. Kin tells the story of one village that he went to not too long ago in 2017. And he was chased out of the village by people throwing rocks and people throwing sticks. And as he was running away, he tripped and he fell on a rock and he busted the, the front four uh, teeth of his mouth. And while he was down on the ground, one of the attack dogs let loose by the villagers came and took some big chomps out of his leg. And so he was hurting pretty bad, but somehow he made it back to the village a day or two later, and he talked with the village chief. And Kin said this, Kin said, Jesus forgave me of my sins, so I want to forgive you. Jesus wants me to tell you that he loves you. And a week later, Four members, four members of the, that village came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. God is still in control. In the deepest and darkest circumstances, the Lord is in control. So in Acts chapter 7 and the martyrdom of Stephen, we understand that, that the Lord is in control. Even in this terrible situation, he is in control. And then we, we understand then that the martyrdom of Stephen is not really about Stephen. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about what God is doing in that situation. Now we know that Stephen was a good man. The Bible says that he was a man of good repute. But and we know that the Bible says that God was doing miracles through Stephen. Uh, but we, we should never focus on the person, right? We should never focus on the martyr. And that's one of the problems sometimes when Voice of the Martyrs or other groups talks about martyrs because we often talk about these people like they're perfect people, but they aren't perfect. Uh, and so in Acts chapter 7, I want to redirect your attention to the Lord and to what he's doing in this passage. Let's look at a few key verses together. In Acts chapter 6, verse 10, it says, But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he, Stephen, was speaking. And when I read this verse, I immediately thought of Matthew chapter 10 when the Lord Jesus was giving instructions to the disciples as to what they were to do when they encountered persecution. Listen to this. Jesus told the disciples, It is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now, when you read the sermon of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, it's a great sermon. But the Bible tells us these aren't Stephen's words. It's not because Stephen was so eloquent. But this was the Holy Spirit, in fact, the Spirit of the Father speaking through him. So you can see, even from the beginning of the story, this is all about the Lord and his working through Stephen and through others. Now, when you look at this sermon, and I would encourage you to read this word for word if you haven't already, uh, but when you read the sermon, you'll notice that Stephen talks a lot about the actions of God, what God is doing throughout history. So um, I just wrote down a few of these. Stephen said that God appeared to Abraham. God gave Abraham the covenant. God appeared to Moses. God spoke to Moses. God drove out the nations from the land of Israel. And then Stephen even talks about God not dwelling in homes made by human hands because God is in fact the creator or the maker 
of all things. So you can see throughout the sermon, Stephen is, is mentioning the actions of God and what God is doing. Now if you jump a few verses to Acts chapter 6, verse 15, this is a fascinating verse. It says, And gazing at him, at Stephen, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now we know that Stephen is a human being just like you and I. And there are some people that look happier than other people. But the Bible doesn't say that Stephen had a naturally radiant personality or that his face shone. In fact, when I read this, it reminded me of the passage in the Old Testament that talked about Moses' face shining after he came down from Mount Sinai and had been talking with God. But you know, the Bible says that Moses did not even know that his face was shining. So it's possible that Stephen had no idea that his face was like the face of an angel because it wasn't anything that Stephen did. It was a, it was a result of God in and working through Stephen. Now, if we jump to the end of our passage today, to the end of Acts chapter 7 and verses 55 and 56, we see this. It says, But he, full of the Holy Spirit, this is Stephen, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, I've spent a lot of time studying this particular passage of Scripture, and I've read a lot of what the scholars have to say about this. And it's particularly unusual because we know that the testimony of Scriptures and the early church through the creeds say that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And here in Acts chapter 7, we see that Jesus is no longer sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he's standing at the right hand of the Father. And from what I can tell, the best explanation as to why Jesus would be standing at the right hand of the Father is to welcome Stephen, the first martyr after Jesus himself. But regardless of why Jesus is doing this, yet again we see that Jesus is acting. Jesus is in control of the situation while chaos is happening on the earth, while Stephen is dying. Actually, God is in heaven seated on the throne, and Jesus Christ is at his right hand, standing, welcoming Stephen into heaven. God is in control. God is acting in the situation even when we can't see it, although God allowed Stephen to have a glimpse of this. This is the story of, of Acts chapter 7, and really the whole book of Acts is that Jesus calls us to be his witnesses. In fact, he proclaims that we are his witnesses. And it's not that we do anything quite special, but simply that we testify to what we see and to what we hear. Um, we testify to the fact that God has saved us, that God is working in our lives. And it's not so much about our powerful words, whether we're a good preacher or not, whether we're comfortable with other people, what our personality type is, because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. So every one of us are called to be a living witness. We're all called to be martyrs. And martyrdom, according to the scriptures then, always happens before you die. Martyrdom is a living witness, what we do in, in our day-to-day -day lives. Even in the story of Pastor Han, we continue to see this truth lived out on a daily basis. I remember where I was on April 30th, 2016. I was hiking on one of the mountains in Seoul with my children when I heard the news about Pastor Han. Uh, it felt like a terrible day. But now, over the years, we've seen God's grace, and we've seen glimpses of how the Lord has been in control of this whole situation. And one of the ways that we've seen this is through meeting many of Pastor Han's disciples. About a year or a year and a half ago, we were blessed to meet this woman, this woman that you'll see in the picture. We'll call her Mrs. C. Mrs. C used to go back and forth to China to try to earn extra money. And on one of those occasions, she stayed in the home of Deacon Jong. Deacon Jong, unfortunately, is in prison in North Korea to this day. But while she was in his home, Pastor Han visited that home. 
and Pastor Han shared the gospel with Mrs. C. Mrs. C was so frightened, she said, in fact, that Pastor Han could see how frightened she was, and she came over, he came over to Mrs. C and laid his hand on her head and prayed for her, and she said she remembered feeling the peace of the Holy Spirit, and, and in fact, she attributes it to that moment that she became a Christian. Now, she went back to North Korea, and um, she was actually questioned because all of the disciples or people who had met Pastor Han were rounded up, but somehow uh, she was able to get out of that situation, and she later went back to China in hopes of making more money, but unfortunately, she was sold um, into sex trafficking and eventually escaped from that situation and, and made her way to South Korea, and she began attending our underground technology basic discipleship school, and um, She's grown in the Lord, and in fact, we've taken her all over the world to different countries to share her testimony. But the neat thing about this whole story in my mind is, is just how the Lord was in control of the situation and how we're able to see the blessings and the grace of God even four years after Pastor Han was brutally killed. His disciples are still coming out of the woodwork, still giving testimony to the grace of God and still saying how the Lord used Pastor Han to change their lives. When we think of being a living witness for the Lord, we remember that the Lord is in control. We remember that the Lord never turns his back on us. He never forsakes us. We remember that no matter what we feel, even if we are pressed in on every side, even if our situation looks terrible, we know that the Lord is with us. We remember that the, light, that the light shines even in the darkest places and that the darkness cannot put the light out. Amen. I'd like to close this morning by praying together. And maybe as we pray, we could even lift up Mrs. C together and the other disciples of Pastor Han. And specifically, I mentioned Deacon Zhang that worked with Pastor Han, and Deacon Zhang was imprisoned in North Korea and still remains in prison to this day. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, even online. We consider it a great opportunity and know that there are folks around the world today who suffer for doing this very thing. But Lord, we thank you for the living witness and even the witness in death that many of our brothers and sisters around the world have made. Lord, we thank you for the witness of Pastor Han. And Lord, we thank you that we are still meeting his disciples and maybe even expect to meet other disciples as the years go by. But Lord, we know that the special thing is not Pastor Han himself, but that it was you working through Pastor Han and that even in the deepest, darkest moment that you never left. You are always in control, and we're still seeing the beautiful things that you're making out of a difficult situation. Lord, we do lift up Deacon Zhang this morning, and Lord, we pray for your peace and your comfort. Lord, I pray if it's possible, you would somehow let Deacon Zhang know that people around the world are praying for him even right now. Lord, I pray we aren't always guaranteed that we'll feel your spirit, but Lord, I pray that he would sense and feel your presence with him even this morning. And of course, we pray for his release. Lord, we pray for a miracle to happen and that he could be reunited with his family here in South Korea. Lord, we're encouraged and we're challenged this morning to be living witnesses. That, Lord, it's, it's not simply about how we die, but it's about how we live on a daily basis. And Lord, we know that that's what the Bible calls a martyr, that living witness. Lord, we give you thanks and we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. We really appreciate you coming all the way from mm -hmm. Seoul to bless us from here. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a blessing, and I know you may be just as thankful as I am for God bringing this very important word to us, as well as these very powerful testimonies. Um, let's be praying for the things that Pastor Tim and the people that Pastor Tim shared with us today. In fact, that's what the prayer notes are all about this week. So if you go to our prayer and fasting notes, Pastor Tim provided these um, prayer requests that were actually from your partners with Voice of the Martyrs Korea. So they're real people right now who are 
reaching out to the church, to brothers and sisters, to pray for very specific situations. Let's do that. And did you hear it today, church? God is in control. He is still in control. Let us speak as if he is in control. Let us act as if he is in control. Let us be his living witnesses. And Pastor Tim will also join us this Saturday for our conclusion of seven days of prayer and fasting. He's going to lead our prayer time, and that's from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. this Saturday, May 16th. We'll send out the online platform link again to the vision team and to our prayer groups, upper room prayer groups. If you are wanting to be a part of that and you're not on one of those lists, reach out to us by email, admin at the nations.asia, and we'll send that to you as well. Um, One more thing. Kids haven't forgot about you. Your shekel activity is related to these prayer notes. So what you're going to do is go to these notes and um, any, any day or all the days, read through them. If you want to do that with your parent, great. And then write out a prayer in the leave the reply, reply section. It's on the very bottom. It's the comment section. You can put your name there and um, yeah, write out your prayer. It could just be one of those notes or as many as you like. It doesn't matter. The amount doesn't matter. Just at least one. It would be helpful for us to know and then we'll keep you right there with us in terms of the activity and being engaged in what God's been speaking to us this morning. Thank you again, Pastor. Mm. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Yeah. Mm. It was a wonderful joy. And I'm going to leave um, you guys with this here at home. Um, there's uh, some discussion and prayer points. Here, we're going to put that slide up. Just share with each other what you learned from God's word today. Uh, what did he speak to you about? And then if you can, go to the prayer notes to this morning for today. It's already posted, I hope. But it's, it was scheduled at least. And then you can pray together as a, as a family for the specific request. Praise God. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. God bless you as well the week and see you on the next Sunday.